Hey, good morning, everybody. It's November 4th, and I'm sure everybody's all excited about the elections or maybe not so excited about the elections. I'm not sure, but uh, um, hey, let's get in the word and um, just focus our mind a little bit on uh, the Lord. So I'm pretty stoked to get in here as always. And Peter just gets done giving this wonderful sermon on the day of Pentecost and to um, a bunch of people that were there for the festival, uh, and uh, they were commemorating the law of God. And during the law of God, if you read the book of Exodus, you'll find that 3,000 people died, actually, uh, because of their mishap. Um, you can read Exodus chapter 32, and you could check that out on your own. Well, here, 3,000 people come to know Christ, and uh, I love what Peter says to the crowd that's there at Pentecost. When um, some of them were cut to the heart, um, meaning they, they heard what Peter was saying about, he was doing a Bible study, if you will, on um, the, uh, who Jesus is and that what they were re, uh, currently seeing in the, the tongues that were being spoken and the praises of God, that they were um, a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And it says they were cut to the heart. And that's exciting to know that if you want people to really go through a change in their life, you know, teach them the word. Help them understand the Bible. Help them understand what it's teaching, what it says. You know, the words of Christ um, and uh, are, are super powerful. And, you know, you trust it. And, uh, you know, I, did, I certainly didn't know uh, anything about the Bible. But when I started reading it, it's amazing how the words just spoke to me in so many ways. And um, so, uh, you know, I was reading this quote by um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was an atheist philosopher. Um, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if he was an atheist, actually. But he says, The majesty of the scriptures strikes me with admiration, as the purity of the gospel has its influence on my heart. I mean, that's amazing, huh? Um and he says, Behold the works of our philosophers with all their pompous diction, how mean and contemptible they are by comparison with the scriptures. And, um, and then he goes on to say, Is it possible that a book at once so simple and sublime should be merely the work of man? I mean, that's radical quotes, right, from Mr. Jean-Jacques Rousseau about the scripture. But the scripture can cut to the heart. You can trust it. Now, notice what Peter doesn't say. When people say to Peter, and, and when, Peter, when people say to you, hey, what, hey, by the way, man, hey, what should I do? Phil, what do I need to do to be saved? Bob, what do I need to do to be saved? You know, that kind of thing. Notice Peter doesn't say, hey, man, you know what? You really need to take a class um, on baptism. And if you take a class on baptism, you know, maybe a six-month course, you know, then you'll be ready. Or he doesn't say, hey, you know, first um, do this and this and this and this and that. Um, what does he say? Repent and let e every one of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the way the Jewish people... Um, symbol the way they showed a change of direction now this was a cultural thing cultural religiously cultural because it's in the Old Testament the way they showed a change of mind a change of direction life direction was through immersion so I want you to really be clear with that just as uh, utensils forks, knives could be immersed in water and come out being now clean. Now, even though the fork and the knife, nothing changes with the material, whether it's dunked in water or whether it's not, the water symbolized change in the Jewish mind, in the Hebrew way of thinking. That's what was taught in the Torah. So baptism is not a New Testament concept very misunderstood, right? He says, repent, and that word mean, uh, it, to, means to change 
<clears throat> your mind, to have a change of mind. So what does he say? Change your mind about God. And what do we do? Um, what does our culture do when we're changing our mind? We get baptized. That's what we do. So, uh, it, you know, the ceremony of baptism itself didn't do anything for anybody. That's what they did to show a change of direction. You know, we don't necessarily do that. The Gentile world wasn't taught. We, we, we never thought that way. Not to be immersed in water meant to be a change of direction. We are ch going from this thing to that thing. We're going from being single to married. So we go through mikvah, right? Not that wasn't that happening. Jesus going from carpenter to now the cross, change of direction. What does he do? What does a Jew do when they're going to change direction? Immersion, baptize, right? That's what we do. That's what they do. So he doesn't make it, the point is, is he's not making it complicated to the, the listeners. He's not giving them a list of things or, you know, hey, man, if you if you read your Bible five times a day or if you pray this prayer 50 times or I, I don't know, you come up with your thing. But, you know, um, um, if you speak in tongues, then you'll, you know, be saved. So here, say banana, banana five times and then maybe after, you know, or 20 times or 50 times and then maybe it'll happen and then you're saved. And he says, repent, change your mind. And then he says, what do we do when we change a direction? Immersion. Immersion in Jesus Christ, in the name of Christ. That's the change of direction. It's going in the, the, the person that we're being baptized in. We're going in that direction now for the remission, for the forgiveness of sins. So what a wonderful passage um, and so simple, right? We make it so complicated, but it's so simple. Do you guys make it simple for people to come to know the Lord? Have a change of mind about who Jesus Christ is and, and change your direction. That's what immersion was about. Immersion was a part of repentance, change of direction. And so, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. And we ended that last uh, yesterday on just that. The, it's the Lord who will call. What is your job and my job? It is to simply sow the seed. Spread the seed, right? Just to be a good sower and um, just to share share the word and then it says that the Lord our God will call now remember some people were amazed by what was happening with the speaking of tongues during the time of Pentecost some people were perplexed some people mocked and other people it says gladly received um, the words that Peter spoke and so the Lord our God will call. He is the one who will call. And isn't that totally how it is? Think of your life. I mean, wasn't it just like a phone call? I mean, for me, it certainly was. It was just like a phone call. Like someone picked up a call in my brain or like, a you know, picked, a, picked up a phone and called my, my head. And it was like, you're, you're mine. You know, whoa. And it was kind of a, a an interesting experience to say the least and sometimes when people ask me how to how I became a Christian I, I always sometimes started off by saying you know uh, a very interesting experience um, because it, it felt a, a very much like a call and like someone really called my my mind and something opened up and notice that um, you know, the word of God is that thing that God has chosen, the foolish things of that which is preached, Paul said in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. The foolish things being the words, in, in, in a sense it's the idea of just the simple things of the word of God being preached, that God has chosen those things 
to open up the minds of the blind and the deaf. So sometimes our wisdom can get in the way of just simply sharing what the scriptures teach. And it says that, so we have to trust the Lord will call. And by the way, when you realize something so cool about God, and that is God will call those, he has people that he's calling, then then it gives you confidence to share too, because now you realize that the Lord's the one who calls. So you don't have to do it. You know, it's the Lord, the one that calls. You are the one that gets to proclaim and just share um, the scripture. And it's the Lord who has already called, right? And the interesting thing is in, in the book of Second Timothy, we see that the call is from the foundations of the world. Wow. Those who God foreknew, though he also predestined. The book of Romans talks about that in uh, chapter 8. And uh, you can read that as well. But very interesting. Um, God who does not live in time or bound by time. Um, sometimes we're, uh, we, we have a, an, a little unveiling of that in the scriptures and it kind of blows our mind. The point is, is that if God calls people, then you don't have to worry about making people a Christian, you know, that kind of thing. It's the Lord that calls. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, right? We don't get the words that Peter shared at this point. Uh, Dr. Luke just tells us that with many other <laughs> words <laughs> that he testified, right? He shared probably of his own life or his own story, right? Do you have your own story to share? What is your story like? Uh, do, are you excited to share your t your your story? Um, I was up at uh, a wedding not too uh, long ago, the other um, and uh, my wife and I, and we were sitting at a table in the um, groom's dinner uh, uh, was taking place, and someone came up to us and sh uh, knew that I was officiating the wedding and had a question about my life, and that's always fun and exciting to share a testimony. And um, so Peter shares and he exhorts, he encourages, he warns, right? He, he uh, brings them to places of decision. And that's always a good thing to do, too. Do we ever ask people, hey, you know, have you ever thought about your life? Or what do you think about life? You know, is there a life after death? Um, you know, would you want to know Jesus? Um, have you ever thought about Jesus? Have you ever thought about the Bible at all and what the Bible has to say about history or has to say about the person of Jesus? Um, you know, asking those questions, moving people to make decisions. It says, he exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse, crooked generation. Now, just so you know, every generation seems to be quite crooked. And, um, you know, so sometimes we always say, man, this generation's the worst, you know? And... Um, but uh, it might be just degree of crookedness. You know, um, you might get a hockey stick and it's straight, but then you might bend it a little bit, right? The curve of, of it so you can shoot a puck real fast. And then you could curve it some more, and then you can curve it some more, and then you can curve it some more. So much so where you can't even use it to shoot a puck anymore. It's no longer functioning at all. And maybe that's what we mean when we talk about this generation's horrible. Maybe we mean that there's just a degree to which the culture's culture will get to that it's no longer going to function at all um, for its intended purpose. And um, and I, I don't know, that's just my thought of that because every generation has a crookedness to it. And if uh, the days of Noah, if everybody drowned in the flood because of uh, their iniquity, uh, they're bent. They're bending towards sin, um, um, unrighteousness, sinful behavior, right? Well, can you name a generation that does not have sinful behavior, iniquity, transgression in it? I don't think you'd be able to do that. So every generation has this idea of being crooked, perverse, filled with iniquity, bending, right? And it's so true that when you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. And that's what happens all the time in history. It just repeats and repeats and repeats. And it goes in circles like that. 
the pendulum always swings. It's always going the far this way, far that way, and it might be just again the that the 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 pendulum swings more and more and more uh, extremely to the right and to the left as time goes on. But it is swinging. Don't um, get that wrong. It's swinging. And so uh, Peter sees his generation as crooked, and he might be able to sit with us and tell us just how crooked his generation was. And let's face it, he's, his generation was a generation that put Jesus on a, a cross. So um, I would say that's pretty intense. Um, then those who gladly received the word were immersed, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And they stayed together. Remember, there's all these people from all over the Roman uh, Empire, um, all over the place. And they're all coming together. And all of a sudden, this happens. And now they're all there. They're all staying there. So what do they do? They hang out together. Verse 43 says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Fear in the sense of a great fear of God, a reverence for God. Um, these guys were God-fearing people, people that really wanted to live for the Lord. That's the idea there. Not fear as in, man, I'm freaking out. You know, but like a reverence, like, whoa, dude, something's happening. And, um, and I need to pay attention. And uh, that it happens in our life where we kind of come to sometimes some crossroads where we go, whoa, dude, I need to pay attention to what's happening in my world. And why am I being overwhelmed? Why am I so filled with anxiety? Why am I so fearful here? Why am I so controlling? Why is this happening? And then all of a sudden you have this like epiphany of this fear of the Lord. Like, man, I need to focus once again on the Lord. Boom, and there's this attention grabber. You know, well, this definitely was an attention grabber, right? Um, um, this t day of Pentecost, and uh, and it's, it it says now all who believed were together, and that's a popular term uh, word, I should say, in the Book of Acts. They were together, and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, this is a really cool statement that gets taken all over the place. Some people go, oh, well, there's socialism there. There's communism there. There's this there. There's this there. And they try to kind of work out a system. But you forget that what's happening is you have people that are traveling from all over the region that have come to Jerusalem, like I said, for Pentecost. And they have now stayed in the area. So what do the brothers do? They make sure that they share their wealth with them to care for them. What a beautiful thing. They do it with gladness and simplicity of heart. The only time that word simplicity of heart is used in the New Testament, and it means without rock, smooth. The idea you get, the idea I get in my mind is without fluff, without extra stuff. They had simplicity of heart, mind. You know, there wasn't a lot of, you know, that stuff, a lot of bling, you know, going on in people's individual lives. They really simplified, and in a sense, they kind of were maybe plain, you know. Maybe everybody just, like, went to, you know, just became a plain person. And I remember when this happened where, I, you know, where, all of a sudden, you come to Christ, and you become, in a sense, kind of plain. You know, you no longer dye your hair. You no longer wear your earrings or your nose ring or your whatever, you know. And you no longer have these things. You, and it's not that it's wrong to wear a ring. It's not. I'm not saying that at all. But you get the idea that uh, I'm giving you an example of sometimes, like, you can have so much fluff, Right? that you seem to separate yourself from everybody else. And it seems that what Luke is telling us, Dr. Luke, is that these people weren't, weren't about the business of so much being different from, from the other brothers and sisters in Christ, but they all just came together as one, and there was a unification in them, and there was, there was a simplification in their life as well. There wasn't all that fluff that was important anymore. 
and it was really more about just being together and breaking bread and being in prayer and learning the word together and that's what we do in the church we learn the word together we pray together we take communion together we lift up prayers together and this is what we do we do it together in unity right and we share with one another that's why we give in the fellowship um, and then the leadership of the church as we see in the book of Acts we're going to see is distributes and helps out make sure people are taken care of um, and that there's discernment uh, being used when that's happening and so this is a great pattern we see they continue daily and I love that um, they were daily amongst one another and it's hard for all of us daily sometimes to be together with one another um, and uh, so it's important for us to sometimes reach out touch base with people uh, you know when you're married it's great because you have someone there that you could uh, get with and pray and seek the Lord with um, and if you're single, get with a brother and uh, or a sister and uh, make sure you stay in touch. That's what they did. They continued daily. Um, and that's so important. And it says that they were praising God and having favor with all people. Isn't that great? I love that word favor, grace, right? They were praising God. That's their focus, right? Praising the Lord, enjoying Jesus. Um, you know, you're going to pray something in the world. Everybody praises something. Everybody gives glory to something. Why? Because everybody is built to worship. Nobody on the planet is not built to worship. Everybody worships something. Everybody's built to worship. They praise. We watch a sporting event and we praise. We lift up the people that do amazing acts, feats that are outstanding. Well, what they're doing is they're seeing that God does amazing feats, beautiful work and freeing people from their bondage to sin, meaning the unforgiveness, the guilt that is attached to our transgressions, that is now forgiven. So now we are free from the consequences of our sin. We have been forgiven. It doesn't mean we don't go through consequences here on the planet, um, but what it does mean is that eternity, we are forgiven before a holy God. And so sometimes, just so you know, we have to remember that, that sometimes we will have to face the consequences here for what we've done, you know. Um, I did some drugs when I was younger, you know, and there's going to be consequences to those things for sure. And there was, and, and uh, there could still be, you know, I could have messed up some things for sure. Maybe that's the way, reason why I'm, I'm the way I am. No, <laughs> just, but you know how that goes. But to know that my sins are forgiven, my guilt, you know, um, it was taken care of my guilt and shame um, so they praise God and having favor with all people um, you know is God worthy of your praise today why why is he worthy what is worthy of your praise today what are you going to praise and it says and the Lord added so as they gathered as they gathered together and sought the Lord the Lord added to the church who adds to the church the Lord adds to the church. He's the one who calls. He's the one who adds. It's his church. It's his work through the Holy Spirit using us. And that's what the book of Acts is about in a nutshell, really. So what a wonderful section of scripture, right? So many cool little lessons, cool little points. So, hey, have a great day. And uh, I pray that you guys uh, enjoy it. And uh, things might not always go our way, and or things might go our way. Um, but, you know, we always remember the, the great picture. Um, um, and, that is, uh, uh, and that is the real thing that's praiseworthy is the Lord. And so uh, that stays consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We learned in the book of Hebrews, and we can trust that. So take care.